Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. I will spend about five minutes presenting the research agenda that um, Dr. Narula um, mentioned that was uh, developed with GTFCC and, and um, Wellcome Trust and others. And then I'll talk some about our own research for about 10 minutes. Um, so for the WASH related color control and prevention research priorities and agenda, um, the, I, the goal of the color roadmap research agenda is to identify knowledge gaps most important to color experts and stakeholders, to establish a prioritized list of research questions that will have a significant impact on achieving the color roadmap goals, and it's linked to the roadmap. So the, the research agenda is very much tied into the goals of the roadmap in terms of um, color eradication. And then the research can help us accelerate progress on color control, um, faster, better, and at lower cost. The agenda has a, a long history. Uh, it began in July 2018 when a working group was convened for a meeting um, by GTFCC, Wellcome Trust, and DFID. Um, this meeting came out and identified six priority research areas. This was a meeting where people discussed um, the priority research areas were commonly implemented, severely under-researched, interventions, community outreach response teams, um, also known as RRTs or CAD minimum wash packages, OCV and wash synergy, behavior and practices, motivation and barriers, and programmatic learning for integrated response. These research areas were then um, expanded by a literature review and expansion um, that was completed by EpiLinks and funded by CDC. And that fed into a larger process that Wellcome Trust led um, to identify research priorities. So this larger consultative process um, was working with EpiLinks, the WASH Working Group, to identify over 450 research gaps. The project team then reviewed and reformulated research questions into a standard format. And then they were those research questions were reviewed and iterated with 20 experts, including through bilateral discussions. This work was um, done um, in collaboration with Welcome by MM Global Health. Um, in the end, research questions, um, 93 total research questions entered a prioritization process. Overall in this process, there were contributions from 177 color experts and stakeholders working at global, regional, and country levels. They represented researchers, donors, program implementers, and policymakers across expertise, regions, and organization types. It became um, from a small working group that had a private meeting. This became a, a much larger worldwide consultative process. Within the WASH pillar, um, there were five prioritized research questions. The first one was what levels of coverage for relevant WASH interventions are required in hotspots to control and ultimately eliminate cholera? What are the most essential IPC interventions in cholera treatment facilities and ORPs to reduce risk of transmission? Is improved access to safe water effective in controlling and preventing cholera? How can design thinking be used to improve the delivery and uptake of WASH interventions? And what are the factors and determinants that lead to sustainable investments in WASH at the country level? These were the prioritized research questions for WASH. Now, there were also cross-cutting research questions that did some of those top five cross-cutting research priorities did include a WASH component. So is there an additional benefit to adding WASH packages, for example, WASH kits to an OCV campaign? What's the most cost-effective package of WASH and OCV in different situations? And what are effective strategies to scale up household water treatment in controlling cholera outbreaks? There's a full report with all the questions. It can be um, downloaded and is available. 
Um, but I wanted to highlight this research roadmap is not about having um, just this report as a stagnant report. The idea is to identify these research questions, decide the criteria, decide the context, score and prioritize these research questions, develop this roadmap, which has now been developed and available, and then have advocacy, action, and monitoring and evaluation, right? And so there's a number of people involved and groups involved in this, including the WASH Working Group. And moving forward, the idea is the WASH community can use the roadmap research agenda. Researchers can use it as a tool to prioritize funding, design and execution of research. Donors can use it to identify research projects with the most impact. Uh, program implementers can collaborate to complete research and use results. And national policymakers can incorporate research priorities and goals into national color control plans. So there's input needed as this moves forward, particularly on examples or case studies in which research is used to inform policy funding and implementation. And then also there's a plan to launch a cholera research tracker, um, which will be um, hosted at GTFCC in partnership with Welcome um, in terms of tracking research so we know where the cholera research is at. And I wanted to say thank you. This is an introduction to this. I think I will now go on to, that was um, six minutes on um, that. I will now go on to talking about some of our research at Tufts and how that fits into this. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about research, recent research um, on cholera at Tufts University. Um, this work was done uh, primarily with Gabrielle String, Camille Halen, and then um, I'll have some slides from Karin Gallandat as well. So um, the first thing I'll talk about is one um, court or CADI or RRT intervention that is often discussed, which is whether to use spraying or, um, or household disinfection kits. Household spraying, as we all know, is a traditional approach, but the guidelines currently deprioritize or do not recommend it for a set of reasons, including lack of evidence, right? Additionally, the international guidelines are now saying to use household disinfection kits where households will receive a kit to clean their households themselves. It's a new intervention with limited implementation. It also has a, a lack of evidence, although it is more highly recommended. Um, we worked with R2HC funding to look at both laboratory and field investigations of these to look at the balance of, of when might be appropriate for which intervention. In the laboratory, we evaluated the efficacy of different spraying and wiping guidelines against V. cholera on various surfaces. So we had 10 surfaces from dirt to stainless steel, two chlorine concentrations, three chlorine types, two exposure times, one minute and 10 minute, two applications, spraying and wiping. Um, we inoculated all the surfaces with a, a spike dose of actual Vibrio cholera. We ran 240 tests across this methodology. What I wanna highlight is for the spraying results, you see at one minute and 0.2%, you see um, relatively high log reduction in this, these graphs, higher bars are good because it's higher log reductions. So you want bigger bars for these graphs I'm showing you. Um, so at one minute, 0.2% chlorine, seven of the 10 tests achieved a three LRV standard. Although you see for these, um, for the porous surfaces, it was lower. At 10 minutes, everything pops up to where we want it, um, close to it, above three L LRV. And at 2% higher concentration, we see everything pop up to exactly where we want it, above three LRV. So spraying can work with the right concentration at enough time on all the surfaces. For wiping, we see the bars are lower. We had less um, efficacy on wiping, um, only three of 10 tests at the one minute 0.2. We see it higher at 10 minutes, but we're seeing it really low here on the right with our porous surfaces. And even when we bounce up to the 2%, we don't quite see the same efficacy. And in particular, we've lost efficacy on dirt. 
This makes sense because wiping has a lower contact time. We know with chlorine, it's, it's contact time and concentration. Lower contact time with wiping, you need a higher concentration for efficacy. So our conclusion from the lab is we saw no significant differences in chlorine type, but there was significant differences. We had increased LRV on surfaces when they were sprayed as opposed to wipe, and we had lower LRV on porous surfaces like our dirt and other porous surfaces. The recommendations were to use 0.2 or 2% when spraying across all surfaces and 2% while wiping. So that's just the lab study. That just tells us how well it works in the lab. We're really interested also what happens in the field. So we had funding from R2HC to evaluate field programs with spraying and with household disinfection kits. These are slides from Karin Gallandot on evaluating three programs, field programs with household spraying. Um, first, she tested for Vibrio cholera on uh, surfaces in households that received court or CADI or RRT interventions. As you can see, higher is orange, and the cholera was more present in both of these programs, program A, program B, on the patient's bed, the kitchen floor, the latrine floor. This makes sense where the cholera actually is on the surfaces. After spraying, in one program, program A, we saw quite a bit of reduction. And in another program, we, we didn't. This was 30 minutes after spraying. Program A had systematic application, um, five to 10 liters per household, five to 10 minutes per household, very systematic cleaning. Program B was a little bit more ad hoc. Implementation matters. Now, after 24 hours, we do see a little bit of regrowth. So there's a question of how long spraying might be effective for. Karin's conclusions were that spraying can reduce contamination if implemented correctly. The intervention coverage is limited and it's hard to find the households. Um, the recommendations for um, if household spraying is implemented with systematic procedure to ensure complete coverage, particularly in the kitchen, spray until wet, increase community coverage, use spraying opportunities for hygiene promotion, and travel with some way to find the house. Very practical. Now, we also had money to look at household disinfection kit implementations, and we couldn't find any. We couldn't find anyone who was actually implementing household disinfection kits in the field. So Camille changed the study design, and we interviewed implementers at the national and international level. And we did in-field pilot study on use in Haiti, where we had two different types of training we tested out because one of the limitations we heard about household disinfection kits were how do you train users to use them. Um, the KII results were really interesting. Overall, we saw a huge confusion, particularly at the field level between what's a household disinfection kit versus a hygiene kit, and a huge disconnect. The international level respondents said, use household disinfection kits. The national level said, we don't even know what those are. We've done spraying forever, we do spraying. And so it was often not a choice, there was a lack of knowledge. Themes emerged around effic effectiveness and certainty of the method. There were more drawbacks listed than advantages for both interventions. Implementation, the difficulty of getting teams out, the difficulty of training, this perceived gap of effectiveness. Chlorine bleach, bleach perception, the, the, whether or not it's safe to give households bleach and beneficiaries behavior change, whether or not people can do it. And in the end, it was questioned about whether household disinfection should even be a priority. We did a field study. Again, we saw bedroom, latrine, and kitchen floors had the highest contamination. And we saw, not surprisingly, that people who received a longer, more intensive, more difficult to implementation demonstration session to use household disinfection kits did a lot better than just being handed a kit with a short lecture in actually using the kit. And so if you are going to ask people to clean their own house, training is required. That makes sense. Even with the training, only about two thirds of people use the correct concentrations. So this is really complex and I wanna get at this. Often we talk about household spraying or household disinfection kit, which is better, which should be promoted, but it's really about factors related to efficacy, implementation, training, socio-behavioral. There's a lot here. And I think we need to break down the which is better to understand how to do this and where potentially is best. I just have two more slides to answer one more research question with some 
hot off the press data, there's been a lot of questions about whether ceramic filters, which are a locally acceptable household water treatment option, efficaciously able to remove E. coli through size exclusion, like macaroni through a strainer, physiochemical reactions and disinfection with silver could also remove V. cholera, right? Particularly in countries like Yemen, where these filters are made locally and highly acceptable and chlorine taste and odor is, is it limits chlorine use. We actually, this is data we were just analyzing. We analyzed eight filters. The filters are numbered one, two, three, four, five, six. The ones with the S on them have silver in them. The ones without the S at the end on the bottom do not. We found that filters with silver, again, higher bars or bigger, had high LRVs for E. coli and V. cholera. It worked for both. But filters without silver had lower LRVs for V. cholera than E. coli. And in particular, we found for V. cholera, which is a smaller bacteria than E. coli, it will slip through that strainer a little bit easier. The silver mechanism is critical for ceramic filters to work. Now, silver depends on the manufacturing. Silver can elute over time, depending on influent water quality. And we need some ways to confirm silver. But what we saw is when those ceramic filters had silver, they can be effective against V. cholera, which might be particularly useful in contexts such as Yemen. I just want to end there. I'm going to stop my share and come back to the Q&A. Just give some examples of the type of research that comes from the research agenda. Thank you so much for um, having me, and I'm happy to take questions.